It's my privilege tonight to be able to introduce our main speaker for this week. Uh, Richie Sessions is the senior pastor at Independent Presbyterian Church in Memphis, Tennessee, and is the only RYM speaker in our 40 years that has ever been uh, the main speaker five consecutive years. Uh, I think he has spoken even more than Joe Novenson now. And uh, he is someone that that we think is uh, uber gifted uh, by God in his preaching ability to connect with whether it's a junior high student, a senior high, um, adults, whomever it is, uh, Richie's just a great connect in bringing the gospel. And we've asked him to come this week to talk about the theme, friendship with God, and to lead us all every night to the feet of Jesus. And so will you join me in welcoming Richie Sessions? All right. Wow. How's it going? I know we're tired. I'm excited to be here. Turn, turn with me to 1 John. 1 John, verse 3, verses 1 through 3. So we're going to look at the friendship of God through the eyes of, his, of different friends. Um, who better to ask? I was watching uh, something on PBS. Uh, it was some... You know, maybe some of you saw it. It was some big, you know, uh, tribute to Will Ferrell, and he was given some big award. And Will Ferrell, the funny guy, like funniest person in the world, or whatever. And they were, uh, and they were asking all his friends these different things about him. So all these funny things to say about Will because they all knew him so well. And that's true with any tribute, right? The the way you're going to know someone the best is you're going to ask their friends. And so that's what we have in the Bible. We have actual testimony of people who know God, and especially tonight, who knew Jesus Christ and who knew the earthly person, Jesus Christ, who lived on this earth. John was Jesus' best friend. In fact, John gave himself the title, the one whom Jesus loved. Okay, The reason he gave himself that title is because he was so amazed by how loved he was by Jesus. And so 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3, we're going to look at this love. See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God, and so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know Him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. Let's pray. Lord, this is your word. You have brought us together here. And so I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would captivate us by the person of Jesus. Lord Jesus, be present with us here. We need you to be our friend. We desperately need you. Open our eyes, unstop our ears, and soften our hearts and give us faith. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Okay, so John is Jesus' best friend. And he's an old man when he's writing this, this letter, first, what, we, what we call 1 John. He's an, old, he's an old pastor. He'd seen everything. He'd seen it all. And he's writing this letter to these people, reminding them about the nature of this love that God has and how it changes everything. It changes the way they live. It changes the way that they suffer. It changes the way that they treat each other. It changes the way they treat the world because they were, because John wanted them to understand this love because no one had, had a better understanding of it, humanly speaking, than John. John is the person, hey, everybody's back there, everybody, okay. Uh, This is kind of cool seeing everybody on this side. Um, John was this person that at the very last night, right, the night, the night before Jesus was betrayed, the Last Supper, John was so close to Jesus that he was, he was laying his head on Jesus' chest. He was lying back like, like, a, like this good friend. They were, they were there together. Jesus had washed their feet and they had broken bread and they had had this tables, fellowship. They had this meal together. And at the end, John loved him so much, he just laid back 
And, and here's how close John was to Jesus. He heard, he could hear the heartbeat of Jesus of Nazareth. And so here's his message. At the end of his life, the early church fathers say that Jesus, that, that, that John was so old that they had to sort of bring him in and he couldn't even stand and they just brought him in front of the people and this, is, this was his sermon. Lo- love, every, love one another. That was John, the apostle, like, love just, amen, let's close in prayer. Y'all just need to love one another. And so here's the point tonight. The friendship of God through the Apostle John, now listen to me, listen to John, is about love. He couldn't get over it. And as you are sitting right here in this this folding chair tonight, in this place called the Promised Land, and we've worshipped God, what He wants to tell you tonight is He wants you to be overwhelmed with God's love. That's what he, that's what, that, was, that was John's entire ministry is he wanted people to be totally overwhelmed and astonished by God's love because he had tasted it. Three things tonight, briefly. Let's look at the active love of God, the transformational love of God, and the purifying love of God. From, the, from, from Jesus' best friend, if you're going to listen to anyone, wouldn't you want to listen to the one that, that was called the, the disciple that Jesus loved? Like, he's, let's listen to him. So let's look first at the active love of God. And listen to what he says. Verse 1, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. So he's, this is an active love. This isn't sort of a passive love. A lot of times we think about God as just sort of being up there, uh, away, kind of doing his own thing. God, God is active in history. God is active in creation. God is active in the new creation. God, God pursues. God takes initiative. He's not like hanging out. He's, he's actually initiating love. And it's, that's, the, that's, the, that's what this passage means. And so he says, look. That's what that first word means. Just look. See. Exclamation mark. Exclamation mark. Like wake up. Like, see, behold, stop what you're doing, slap your face, look, is what he's saying. In the, in the middle of this letter, he said, just stop, see, behold, what kind of love this is. In this word, what kind, it, it literally meant in the Greek, what country. That's what it meant. It was, it was to ask someone, what, what, what country are you from? What, what language are you speaking? Or we might say, what planet are you from? So what John is saying here in this passage, he's just saying, see, Stop, behold, see, what, pl- what planet is this love from? What, 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 what does it come from? What country is it from? And we, we think, you, you may hear something of God's love. That seems like the most generic thing ever, like John 3.16, which is like the most quoted right, passage ever. Yeah, God so loved the world. I can't, Richie, I understand God's love. I don't need to hear about God's love. I've, kind of, I've got it good. Let's hear about some more, let's hear about some deeper theological uh, facts. I really would like to discuss those. If you think that you sort of, oh, I've got God's love, check, you, you don't have it at all. You don't know what you're talking about. Because God's love is not something you figured out. God's love is literally something that happens to you because that's what he says. He says, behold what kind or what planet God's love that has been given to us <clears throat> it just, boom. That's what he says. The, the better translation, he just lavished it. Don't you like the word lavish? It sounds like just lavish on us. It's been poured out upon us. That's what Romans 5 says. God's love has been poured into our hearts. In other words, God's love is different than any other kind of love. One commentator says it's a love that's infused into you or injected into you. It actually gets into your bloodstream. It's something that just is outside of you and God just puts it into you. So, so it's not something you figure out or something that you sort of have a nice little compartment. It, it's, it's, it's nuclear. In fact, <clears throat> it reminds me of, of, of baptisms. <clears throat> I'll explain. I did a baptism yesterday. I could do baptisms all the time. Little babies, we're Presbyterians, we baptize babies, and they're in their nice little white dresses, and they're all like, Ooh, you know, <laughs> so precious and cute. And, and, and they're in the mall, you're taking the pictures and everyone's so beautiful and everything. And I get to be the guy that gets up and I ask the questions like, you're going to be a good parent and you're going to try out all this kind of stuff. And they're like, yeah, we're going to do the best we can. We don't know what we're doing. We can't sleep. And, and so, <laughs> and so they have the baby and I get to, and then I put the, I grab the baby every single time and I have this nice silver dish and I get this water 
and I put it on this baby head. And it's this beautiful moment before the baby's just like, ha. Ah. And, and I, put the, I put the water in. He goes, Bruh. like, what are you, like, what is wrong with these sick people? Why will you dress me up and then just put water on me? It's this, but it's a beautiful thing. It reminds me every single time that I get this bird's eye view of exactly what it looks like to have God's love just poured on you to this passive little baby. And what does Jesus describe Christians as? As we're just sitting there passively looking around and then boom, God's love happens to you people. And if there's anything that this week is about, if there's anything that you don't want to miss, if there's anything about the friendship of God you just don't want to miss, if this is the only talk that you listen to, it's it's that you will never get over God's love. You'll never outrun God's love. God's love is something that you will drown in. It is eternal and is forever, and it's what it's all about. He says it's something that is given to you. But here's not this, this is the second thing about God's active love. It tells you who you are. This is really good news for people like you and me who are insecure. We don't know who we are, right? And everyone in the world is telling you who you are. Do you, you ever notice that? Everyone around you is trying to define you. That's, everyone's telling you who you are. And here's, here's the good news. What John is saying in this passage is, behold from what planet God's love has been poured out on us that we should be called children of God. And I want you to notice here, being called children of God is not a title. That's not what that means, being called, like giving a, a title that doesn't mean anything. Being called here means this is a fact. He says this is a fact that you're a child of God. God's love has been poured out upon you, and this is a fact. It is something that you can't change. Well, I don't feel like a child of God. How often do you walk around and go, I feel like this child of God? No, you feel like a rinky-dink weirdo like most of us feel most of the time, right? We have sins, and you have all these things you're struggling with. And here's what he's saying. God's love is so magnificent. It's so from another universe that it's been poured out upon us. And for those who have rested and trusted and run to Jesus and said, Jesus, take me, you are, right this very minute, a child of God. I don't care where you're from, if you're from Texas or from Alabama or from Arkansas or Louisiana or from what family you're from or where you're going to go to school or where you're not going to go to school or how your grades are or how your family is, here is a fact about you. Right this very moment, not because I said so, but because God said so, you, you are a child of God and you can't change his mind about you. I can't get over that, can you? Like if we really started believing that? Because he says it twice. He said, we're, child of, we're, we're the children of God, and so we are. What? What? We're, we're the children of God, so we are, presently. Not like, so I hope to be. And we're the children of God, and so we are. And then he says this again. We are God's children now. Now at 933, July the 9th. If you've trusted in Jesus, you're God's child now because his his love is from another planet. It's from another place. Because God chose you. you know, that's, you know, that's, the gospel, that's the gospel's good news, right? That's why it's good news. It's because he didn't look at you and say like, well, tell me your ACT scores. How are those? How those? <laughs> tell me, tell me, uh, tell me your extracurricular activities. Tell me, uh, tell me who your friends are. Tell me who your folks are. Where do you live? No, that's not, oh, that's not a very nice place. God, before all eternity, like before he created anything, before he created a rock or a fish or a sky or a sun or a mountain, he looked at, looked at us, he looked at us and said, mine, my child, this is my child. I, I love this child. Why? Because this is what I do. I create and I recreate. Why? Because my love is from another planet. My love is from another universe. Folks, in the Delta, in the Mississippi Delta, there was an old farmer that said, if that will not light your fire, then your wood is wet. <laughs> it's so wonderful. His, his love is so active that it not only is something that's given to us, it's not only something that tells us who we are, it, it gives us a new identity, but third thing, it's a passionate and active love. It's a passionate, it's a passionate love. It's, it's one of those loves. Have you ever seen, have you ever seen a mom really Real, or a dad like, really just love on their kids. Have you, ever, have you ever been the recipient 
I have. I remember being in public and my mom just going, it's like, Mom, I'm 27 years old. And you see just this love, or you see two people together, and they're, they're so in love. There is this passionate love that, that's so powerful, it makes you uncomfortable. And you know what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane? In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus of Nazareth, because, because God's love is so awesome, he was so afraid of the hell he was going to experience because of all the sin and everything we thought and everything we've done over our lives. He was so scared about the hell he was going to experience that he cried out to his father, and he said, Father, this is too much. I, if it be your will, can this cup pass from me? And Jesus said, but not my will, not my human weakness. Your will be done. And he, you know what that will is? Listen to me. I don't know how you feel about yourself, but if you're anything like me now or like I was in the past, I don't think I'm that great. You are so precious to the God of the universe that Jesus would drink it to the last drop for you. And the Father would turn his back on Jesus so he could have you. That's a passionate love. It was God's will to love you. Okay. His love is active. His love is, secondly, transformational. It's T, transformational. I know that's kind of a cheesy word, uh, but it's a good word. Transformational. It sounds like a sort of infomercial. But the Father's love is transformational. That means it takes you from one form to another form. That's what it means. And, and here's what that, here's what he, listen to what he says in verse 2. What we will be has not yet appeared. Wow, that's good news. What we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears... We shall see him, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. What does that mean? Okay, here's what it means. Right now, as you are, children of God. You're a child of God. Nothing can change that because God's love is so amazing and you're all messed up and you're sinful and you're doing the best you can. You can't keep the cheese on the cracker, but you are God's child. Here's what he says. It's really good news. What you, what you will be has not yet appeared. It's hidden. What you will be has not yet appeared. So there is something right now about you that is not going to be true about you. There is something right now about you that is temporary, that has not yet been seen, that has not yet been made known. What you will be has not yet appeared. Things are hard. Things hurt. People betray you. You don't like the way you look in the mirror? You don't like the way your family looks. You don't like the way you feel. There's, there's just hurt and pain. But here's what he's saying. God's love is so wonderful. God's love is so wonderful and so eternal. You can't stop him from transforming you. And he is going to transform you. When Jesus returns, he's going to restore everything. There's going to be the greatest reset and recreation ever known. The world will not always be this way. Why? Because God's love from another universe. What we will be has not yet been made known. There's going to be a restoration of everything. You remember the, you remember the story of the ugly duckling? That's one of those stories that kind of made me. Do y'all remember Ugly Duckling? They still read that, right? Is that not politically correct? <laughs> the Ugly Duckling is a story. You have this little duck, this ugly duck. He's with the, all the other ducks, but we know what he really is, but, we, but you're not supposed to know at that time. And there's just this ugly duck, and you feel sorry for all the other ducks pick on the ugly duck until finally over time this ugly duck turns into this glorious, beautiful swan. And all the other ducks are like, what? I can't believe I just did that. <laughs> she's this, she's this, he's this glorious, beautiful swan, and he never really understood that time. At that time, he was this ugly duck, but he was going somewhere. And here's what it means. God's love is going to transform you because when Jesus appears, you will be made like him. Not the exact same. There's only one Jesus, but you will be made like him. That is Jesus' resurrected body. His resurrected body is not a temporary body. It's a forever body. It is forever and ever and ever, and it's the happy ever after. That's what God's whole plan is. That God's love has started because he loved you and he recreate everything to make you a new you. 
the full you. Isn't that good news? And we will see him. Do you hear what John is saying about his friend? I love this. He says, we, we will see him. He's talking about Jesus. We will see him as he is. My wife and I spent our 10-year anniversary in, uh, in Miami, Florida. And, and Laura, my wife, likes to get up and see the sunrise. And uh, I, don't, I don't, I've seen a sunrise before. And I don't really like to wake up that early. So, but she finally says, well, it's our 10-year anniversary, and you're going to be like a good husband or not a good husband, let me know. And so I get up. I get up. I'm kind of walking out there, and there's just this beach and just blackness and just whatever. And so I'm sitting out there, and then on the horizon, it's like this, it's like this conductor. It's like, and then there is this sun that goes, and it begins to, it begins to rise little by little, and then all the darkness, every single corner of that entire beach and that entire city, every single speck of it, because the big sun began to rise, and all the darkness went away. And I'll be, I'll be perfectly honest with you, tears. <laughs> and the reason is, is because I know that one day, as certain as the dawn, he is going to come with healing in his wings. Don't you love that psalm that says, and, they will, and we will bust off, bust out like calves coming from their stalls that have been cooped up. And that is you. We've been cooped up by this life and by our sin and by all the, the limitations. And when the sun rises and Jesus comes back, we will bust out like these crazy cows running out. And we will dance and we will sing all because your Father loves you with an everlasting love. Now you see why John couldn't get over, why you see why John couldn't get over this? He's going to transform you because he loves you with an active love. And here's the third thing. It's a purifying love. It's a love that, that changes you. He says, if we have, anyone who has this hope begins to purify themselves. So what does that mean, to purify yourself? That means you want to be more like Jesus if this is driving, if this is coursing through your soul. You want to be a different person. You think about, how am I going to put the sin to death in my life? How am I going to become this new person? You think about, how am I struggling? Anybody, anybody struggling with sin? Anybody struggling with sin? No one? No one? Everybody struggling. Everyone is struggling with sin in here. Everybody's struggling with nasty, ugly, horrible sin that we don't show anybody here. Because at church camp, right, and certainly we all show each other we've got our big study Bibles, right? <laughs> How's it going? But the reality is there's a part in you that, is, that is, has a gnawing, discontent, hopeless despair over certain sins in your life and shame in your life. And the good news is, is that the only way that that sin will ever begin to die is that if the love of the Father begins to choke it out. God's love is what kills your sin. God's love is what kills your sin. It's what makes you want to be more like Jesus. That's the road to purity. That's the road to holiness is God's love. It changes how we want to live. Let me tell you something. Food tastes better if you taste the love of God. What in the world am I talking about? Food tastes better because now you're not using food to satisfy your soul. Your soul has been satisfied by the, by the Son of God and all that He's done for you. And so now you can actually begin to enjoy food. You can begin to enjoy other things in this world with all their fullness, not wanting them to save you. You actually can interact with this world because you have God's love. I promise you. Christians should be a hallelujah, as John Stott said, a hallelujah from head to toe because this news is so good. I'll close with this. John saw his best friend in his ministry. All of it. All of it. Remember he says in his gospel, he said, there were so many things that happened. And he's like, look, there's so many things that happened. There are, enough, there are not enough books or enough libraries in the entire world to contain them all. He, like John saw it, okay? He saw his entire ministry he saw his best friend betrayed. He saw his best friend killed. He took care of his, his best friend's mama, Mary. He saw him laid into the tomb. But here's the good news. Peter and John, they hear something. 
they hear that Jesus has risen from the dead. I want you to think about your best friend. You'd seen him killed. I want you to hear the news. Hey, Jesus um, is alive. What? Seriously, don't joke with me. Like, no, Jesus, the, the tomb's empty, and people are saying he's alive. And Mary Magdalene said, said she saw him. And so what do Peter and John do? You know, here's, here's what's going on at the end of the gospel. Dun, 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 dun. <laughs> this is happening. They have to see it. They have to see it, right? And so John runs past Peter. Peter stands outside the tomb because he's, uh, uh, he's older than John because John's the youngest disciple. And John runs in, and what does he see? He sees an empty tomb. And later on, he sees Jesus, his best friend, risen from the dead. And he sees him ascended into heaven. And he heard every single thing he said. And here's what his entire message is to you right now. God loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He loves you. He's never going to change his mind about you. May God give us the grace to believe it. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, please sear this message upon my heart, upon our hearts. Lord, give us, give us your grace and your mercy. Be thick in this room this whole week as we praise you and as we learn about you because we want to know you more. We want to be your friend, and you're such a good friend. Thank you so much, Jesus. In your precious name, amen. Please stand.